uh, this time we thought it is hadronic wave functions on the light front. And uh, I expected Ismail to explain practical law motivations. And, uh, but he spent about last five minutes of his talk on it, so I need to do it. So we all know there is vacuum structure and we describe it in Euclidean time. And there are fields and some fields are perturbative gluons and some fields are non-perturbative uh, semi-classical instantons. And uh, one can calculate, invent some models like this instant liquid and calculate correlation functions. Now that was uh, done in the 80s and 90s. The other approach is just uh, ordinary spectroscopy, which people do, uh, do in rest frame, from which, uh, say, for example, uh, quarkonia are very well developed, and you have uh, many states and many calculations. And now this field is in its uh, heyday because uh, many more hadronic states are discovered recently. Now, what we are doing uh, is the slide front quantization. So at one hand, we have many <coughs> observables and there are partonic language and partonic observables, which are this PDF part on distribution functions, mostly. But PDF are just one body uh, density matrix, uh, unlike wave function. So wave function, of course, uh, hadrons and nuclear in particular is a clear state which has a wave function, while PDFs uh, are not, and in particular PDFs have entropy and things like that. So in order to calculate wave function, you need to understand the Hamiltonian, you need to understand forces, and then you need to solve it. And then you need to solve it. So that is what I'm going to tell. Of course, there is one more way of doing it, holographic QCD, which uh, many talks are about it. And I will not discuss it. Oops, what happened? Okay, so here are the papers. There is one paper about, uh, to which I probably come at the end, which is about uh, antiquark C in the nuclear. But the main uh, paper we started collaboration with Ismail on this program was this uh, second paper, which was uh, two years ago, and that was about form factors. So it is a long paper with many complicated formulas. The main thing was that if you calculate one gluon exchange, it give small fraction like 10% of uh, form factor. And if you calculate instant contribution to the uh, hard block, you'll find comparable contribution if you use the old instant liquid model. And at that moment, we said uh, there should be more uh, to it than just the old instant liquid model. And that was the beginning of what I will call dense instant liquid. So it started as a, a program. So you see, uh, we did four papers, and these papers are big technical papers, 50 pages each. And what we are now doing is basically appending these papers with some new result which we get and get the paper number five. So uh, that is what I will describe. Now, in the old days, uh, this uh, pi and nuclear structure in uh, Euclidean correlation functions look like this that the pi was a sequence of tunneling events which hold it together, and the nuclear is a uh, quark by quark picture. But now we, we need to do much more quantitative things on the light front. Okay, so we start with quarkonia. So what you see on this left picture, the red squares are the experimentally observed batonia absolutes as a function of n. n is a principal quantum number. So if you uh, take away uh, spin forces, you get these triangles. And if you take away Coulomb part, leaving only linear potential in Cornell, you get this very nice rigid trajectory. So this is the first message that if you go to heavy quarks and uh, all the details, which are spin forces and even perturbative forces, you throw away, 
you get actually a very nice rigid trajectory. Furthermore, you can see from the right plot that if you go to L equal two orbital momentum, it has the same slope. But the question is, what is the slope and how it relates to elementary slope of observed in scattering of light particles? So here uh, would be our strategy. <coughs> this is our Hamiltonian. In the Hamiltonian, you see here, the Hamiltonian, first of all, its eigenvalue is m squared. Now you see kinetic part, which is this m squared plus k transverse squared, divided by longitudinal x. So it is not spherical symmetric. It's different for transverse and longitudinal. What is nice, however, on the light cone is that there is no big difference between quarkonia with a large mass. So quarkonia are non-relativistic because their mass is much larger than transverse momenta there. And you can use Schrodinger equation in the center of mass. For light quarks, uh, their constituent quark masses are about 300 mV, and their transverse momenta are about 300 mV. However, on the light cone, uh, they appear as a sum. So it doesn't really make a big distinction between, uh, you don't need non relativistic approximation. Everything is relativistic. And then we have, for example, uh, a meson and we have a st uh, string with the tension sigma t. And uh, here we have some, um, some coordinate which appear in the square root. Uh, and one trick which we use is called Einbein trick, which is like this. Uh, this is this formula in the black uh, rectangle. It has parameter a. If you minimize over a, you go back to previous formula and that has a square root. However, if you don't minimize over A first, it's a very nice oscillator and you can solve this Hamiltonian and after you solve it, you minimize over A. Uh, that, that is our main trick. So you see that uh, this kinetic energy is complicated. It mixes transverse, or transverse momentum and longitudinal momentum in this form. However, if we solve the problem in momentum space, uh, in other words, we use coordinates as derivatives. The coordinates are the d over the momentum. So our kinetic energy is this term proportional to sigma t, and uh, which used to be kinetic energy is now our potential. Furthermore, we rewrite it like this. So this term, can you can add and subtract Four. So what it means is uh, in the zero for the Hamiltonian, you have just this term, which is simply quadratic. And then there is a potential written here where this minus four appears. So when X and X bar, which is by the way, is one minus X in mesons uh, are one half, this is zero. But when X or X bar going to zero or one, it becomes large. So this potential we call a cup. It's a potential which prevent uh, uh, a quark having x close to zero or to one. So this potential uh, will be treated as potential and that would be the main problem. But you see that uh, the first Hamiltonian, the basic Hamiltonian is uh, oscillator. And that means that the principle that the eigenvalue, if this V would give you small correction, which would be the case, of the order 20 percent. Uh, this has a spectrum which is linear in M because this is an oscillator. It's also linear in L. And this is what rigid trajectory R, that M squared is proportional to. So we have kind of natural setting in which we are going to get a rigid trajectory and then correction to it by including this potential. That's our first setting. So we started with uh, epsilons and uh, we first calculated them in the linear potential in the usual way. These are these uh, blue circles. And this is principal quantum number on the right. And the free circle are different L's, zero, one, two. Now the triangles are obtained by method of diagonalization of the potential so this potential, this one, 
which non-trivially depend on uh, kt and x. Uh, you can calculate, you can select the basis which correspond to zero order to h naught, and in that basis, write this as a big matrix, and then diagonalize the matrix. Then you get eigenvalues. This is a method uh, very widely used in nuclear physics. It was also used for this type of problem by Jim Reddy and collaborators. So we follow it and uh, taking about a uh, matrix 12 by 12, not very big matrix. I will show you a little later how it works. This is just for eigenvalues. So first of all, you see that at least the first several eigenvalues are produced very well. Once again, what we are doing here, we are solving the blue is the usual Schrodinger equation in rest frame, and the reds are this uh, light front Hamiltonian. So they more or less nicely agree. Now we go to light quark system. Before I go to light quark system, I show you some experiment. Uh, some of it uh, were already in uh, Kobe uh, talk, but of course you wouldn't know what it is. These are omega mesons. So these are the first uh, omega mesons, these uh, stars with five uh, angles. You see that this experiment, so they kind of very nicely uh, sit on one line. These are some which I don't understand why they are not. And this is so-called so omega three, which has total J equal three or L equal two uh, with a spin one. And they also have the same slope and uh, seats over there. So once again, it is a rigid trajectory and it seems to be equidistant L. So uh, that's uh, known things. The line is uh, just alpha prime times S and uh, these black dots are some classical solution, uh, some classical quantization which Kobe have shown. Now, the thing is after we calculated it, we can uh, calculate the first three eigenvalues, for example, shown here as a function of parameter A, that was our trick. So we take it at a minimum and then we get the results, which are these red triangles, which are nicely parallel to, uh, to, the, to, to this uh, rigid trajectory, etc. So in other words, for light quarks, we also get correct rigid trajectory by this method. Now, uh, of course, uh, since we write it as a matrix in some basis, we have a wave function. This is the wave function which we get. So you see here, it's a function of two variables. Uh, rho is et, and it appears in different powers. And these powers are squares. This is because it's in, in some basis, uh, in oscillatory basis. And then we have longitudinal momentum, which is x fraction. And we have different harmonics. And you can see here that there is very nice convergent the coefficient of higher power, small coefficient of higher uh, X harmonic is small. And we can plot it. Uh, and this is this black line as a function of X as a function of T. Now, uh, the other method, uh, several months later after we get this, uh, it turned out that uh, when you have uh, this type of problem with three variables, two PTs and one X, you can directly uh, solve this Hamiltonian in mathematical numerical. And when I plotted numerically uh, the wave function, I found that um, the difference between numerical one and this one is smaller than the width of the line. So here it is not comparison of exact numerical with this. They literally coincide. I compare it to this, uh, function which was proposed by Stan Brodsky and Teramont, they just guess the wave function should be as a function of this variable. He will speak about this variable. Here I uh, want to show you this and you see that um, the difference is not big. This is of course just for a guess, it's pretty good. The main difference between dashed line, which is their formula and the black line, which is this formula is near the edges. Uh, my formula, you have the sine, pi x, etc. So everything goes linearly to the end. 
and in their formula it is much smoother than so if you calculate a coordinate representation by Fourier transform that makes a big difference okay now uh, uh, so we uh, uh, this that's what basic that we can do uh, Hamiltonians on the light cone we can solve it and we get the wave functions which uh, for heavy quarks correspond to what we do in the usual spectroscopy and for light quarks we also can do now we return to germonium and study interquark potentials. So Ismail already uh, have shown this picture and this picture very nicely show uh, what I predicted 40 years ago as the dilute uh, instant of liquid. Now the fact that it was dilute and it has small parameter, different people have different coefficient here. Uh, but it was dilute. Rho over R was about one third to the power of four. And that was very important because these uh, instantons who are far from other instantons uh, retain their zero modes and then their zero modes collectivize and then they make quark condensate and all this kind of uh, physics which uh, was studied for many years. Now we also understand that uh, there is a so-called molecular component. What is instant anti-instant molecule? The instant anti-instant molecule you heard today from uh, Valer Jose, uh, which, so instant anti-instant uh, configuration is kind of unsuccessful tunneling. It's a tunneling which go into the barrier the wave function goes into the barrier and then returns back, yes? It can go over the middle to the other valley, but it can also return back. And that's why uh, the total action at small uh, distances go to zero. So there are many of them, but they don't have uh, uh, zero modes, closed fermionic zero modes, and therefore they are not important to Carl's incubator. We started it with Michel Eugenfried's uh, for finite temperature. At finite temperature, when chiral symmetry is restored above TC, this is the only component basically which remains because individual instantons have very, very small contribution proportional to the product of all quark mass. Anyway, so if we look at a recent uh, latest study of this issue, they do the so-called cooling by gradient flow, which is uh, now popular in latest groups. So, so this is cooling time. And as a function of cooling time, the size of the instanton is tend to be growing because instanton and instanton attract each other and they become less dilute. But uh, the real physics that uh, correspond to uh, interpolation into zero cooling time. So this blue area, blue arrow shows what it is at zero cooling time. You see, it is exactly one third of the Fermi as I suggested 40 years ago. But when you do uh, discuss density of instantons and uh, this paper identify uh, instantons and instantons fit their shape and things there. So if you look at the right figure to the right side of that figure, when you're cooling long enough, you see that this density in Fermi minus four is about one, as again, the dilute instant liquid tell you. But if you project it to zero cooling, namely somewhere here, uh, you get much larger number than one, nearly one order of magnitude larger. So that tell you that yes, there are these uh, pairs, instant on instant pairs, which on the cooling very quickly annihilate, and then they continue to annihilate to Finally, they are dilute enough as they cannot annihilate anything. So the question is what these guys do. And if you uh, put it into the instant potential and instant potential is a long story calculated. Uh, and it was also calculated by uh, Mr. Hanov who is present. Uh, we get this picture. So what is this picture? Ismail have shown this picture. If uh, we have uh, dilute instant gas plus these molecules, which you uh, think is factor six larger, then we get a potential which up to, uh, up to this distance uh, cover 
the uh, Cornell potential for the lack of strings. So we think that uh, up to here approximately, uh, the Cornell potential is actually instant on a cap. And after that, it is probably a string. What is the difference between uh, uh, these two models? One model is that uh, there is a string model and the other is the instant on model. The difference uh, is, uh, should be seen in a spin potentials because the string is electric string. It has electric field inside, but it doesn't have magnetic field. Yet, uh, when we calculate its uh, spin spins in orbit and tensor forces, they are, uh, they are created by interaction between magnetic moment of a quark with the magnetic field. So it is this uh, W uh, Wilson lines uh, with appended uh, plaquette or magnetic field. And uh, the instantons are self-dual, they have a magnetic field equal electric. So in some sense, they have maximum magnetic field for the same electric field. So for the same uh, central potential, which depend on Ws without this B, uh, they kind of maximize uh, uh, spin forces. So we start studying spin forces. Now, uh, what we calculated in, in this model, so we assume that now kappa, this parameter of diluteness is not 110. It is of the order one. And if that is true, then this is what spin forces we calculate. These are from uh, Coulomb. Uh, you have spin spin, spin orbit, and tensor from some formulas well known. And also this correlation functions give us instant on induced. So you see the magnitude is similar and it is better seen here for spin spin. So what is plotted here are three curves. The black curve is what people calculated on the lattice. This is lattice calculation of spin spin force as a function of distance. Distance is an inverse Fermi. So five would be a Fermi. So you see that even in half Fermi, it's already gone. So basically spin spin forces are very short range, are very short range. This is what we calculated from the usual, uh, from the instantons, and uh, this is perturbative. So what you see here is that area under this curve, it is multiplied by R squared. So if you do integral of this with a psi wave function, uh, you will get matrix element of spin-spin uh, interaction, which is observed experimentally as the splitting over here, well known. So what you see here is that perturbative one is about twice smaller than what lattice give. And uh, uh, perturbative and instanton are comparable and together they have area of the order of uh, the lattice one. More precisely, if you calculate matrix element with the wave functions, you get this result. So I don't have time to go for the whole uh, table. Let's look Charmonium as an example. So the splitting between uh, J psi and eta C is this 116 MeV. If you use this lattice potential, spin spin force is basically very close to it. And from out of this, about 60 is from uh, perturbative and 30 from instant. You can go for, for this table, etc. We also studied some other splittings which uh, give us the idea, what is the magnitude of spin orbit and tensor I will omit it. So here is uh, 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 one more interesting thing. If we don't use instanton, but instant molecule, this is example of instant molecule. It has instanton and anti-instanton. So instanton is self-dual, it's B and E are parallel. Anti-instanton is anti-self-dual, it's B and E are anti-parallel. So if you take Wilson line like this, on half of it, the electric field is this way, on half of it, the electric field is that way. So uh, they will cancel each other. So this particular uh, W will be equal one, which means it will, this configuration will not contribute to central potential. However, if you calculate this correlator of, with two Bs, 
which is important for spin forces, the B is the same on both parts and it uh, calculates this. However, if you do other, uh, other orientation of the molecule, you get something else. And if you add them together, average over uh, orientation, you get a curve like this, which is uh, lower than here and larger here. So if you return here, it basically eliminate or reduce this part and increase this part, going it closer to lattice uh, potential. So that's an example of uh, how instantons generate spin forces. And uh, we're going to study it more. This is a very preliminary uh, thing, which uh, I just did uh, on Saturday. And uh, it, these are instanton induced forces for three quarks. So we took three quarks in a particular configuration, uh, some triangle, and there are lattice data. So this uh, open points are lattice data. And there are these lattice data for different triangles, about six different shape of this triangle was calculated. This is equilateral triangle. The way how it is calculated, so you, you see you have the instanton. Instanton is SU2 beast. The three quarks have three colors. So you may think that one of the colors would not be affected at all. So there would be two colors which are affected by field of instanton and the third is not. So that already suggests that somehow the answer should be sum of binary forces rather than instant uh, force. Now, the instant has a particular color orientation. In order to make, to mimic the vacuum, you need to rotate it. So there are these six U's on the end of Ws. And if you average this uh, six U's, half of them are Degas, which I didn't write. Uh, there are so called Weingarten formula, which express uh, colorless combination of this six U's. And that give you rather complicated formulas where this three W's convoluted together in their color indices. So if you do that and the integrate over all instant location, which is three dimensional integral, uh, I get this black box. And what I'm saying here is that uh, without any parameters, I reproduce lattice data for equilateral triangle. And I'm going to repeat it for all other triangles. So uh, the message here is that uh, this dense liquid uh, basically explain um, uh, potentials for mesons and probably baryons. Now uh, we want to solve this uh, baryons and different things on, on the light. Edward, it's about 80 minutes. No? Okay, I'll speed it up. So first of all, uh, uh, let's discuss baryons. So baryons have three quarks, that nine degrees of freedom. But we know that there is center of mass, which is not moving. And we need to use uh, Jacobi coordinate. And so the problem is actually quantum mechanics in six dimensions. Uh, there are different people on the market try to do uh, baryon wave functions. Stan will tell you soon about how he described it by one variable. Uh, some people use it all nine and then try to subtract energy of center of mass. We don't do it. So uh, there is standard procedure how you proceed with uh, free particles like you do helium free. For example, in nuclear physics, you introduce Jacobi coordinate. Here are Jacobi coordinates. There are Jacobi coordinates in transverse coordinate, which uh, is very simple. I don't uh, discuss it here. These are Jacobi coordinates for free longitudinal axis. And the point here is that some of all the axes should be one, which means uh, if you take a cube for each x from zero to one, from zero to one, to zero to one, this condition is a condition. And after that, you have two dimensional problem. So the two dimensional problem is defined on this triangle. And the corners of the triangle are when one of the axes is one and the two others are zero. So we need to do quantum mechanics. Remember, we do in momentum representation. So our uh, momenta are defined in this triangle. The first thing to do is to solve our zero 
other Hamiltonian, which was just uh, Laplacian. So we need to solve a Laplacian inside the triangle. And on the triangle, the wave function on the edges of the triangle is zero. So we learn how to do it. Uh, there is exact solution for Laplacian. And if it is Laplacian plus the cup, remember I have shown you the cup potential, which kind of prohibit the edges that also we can solve. So uh, quantum mechanics on the triangle is done. And we have set on rigid trajectory for symmetric uh, system. So this is uh, UUU, SSS, CCC, and BBB variants. Why the symmetric system? Because in other, there are flavor symmetric good dike works, which very significantly modify this wave function. So this dike work uh, system, uh, the interaction which produced dike works is the Toft interaction mostly, and to some extent Coulomb interaction. So that is what we do in paper number five. This is the end of paper number four. Uh, and uh, so simpler case when you have flavor symmetric uh, systems, uh, you can solve the Hamiltonian like I explained. And uh, they, uh, here, this red and blue, red are experiment, blue are estimates for, for them. By the way, this CCC is supposed to be uh, discovered in the next LHC run. They are shifted by a constant. This constant is very familiar that there is a constant in a Hamiltonian, which uh, we don't get. But then, so what you see here is that they all show rigid trajectory, which are slightly curved, and their slopes are different. Why they're different? They're different because our uh, Einbein trig with this parameter a. So uh, after you minimize over a, uh, the slope depend on the mass of a quark. So you see that this, uh, so that is why they're different from naive parallel lines. The slope is not just tension of a string. However, uh, so how much time I have? Four minutes. Okay, so the last thing is uh, actually the first paper on this uh, uh, set, which uh, shows one more inst interesting instant again. So it was many years ago when these two guys, uh, Doroho and Kochelev, suggested the following: that if you have instant on vertex, it's flavor symmetric, which means G quark can only produce U bar U. U quarks can only produce D bar D. So because you have twice more U's than D's, there would be a, a flavor symmetry of the uh, anti-quark C. And indeed, this is what it is. This is a ratio of anti-D to anti-U. And you see that at some X of the order 0.2, it nearly reaches two. And the gluon mechanism, which was considered to be the dominant, produce U bar U and D bar D in equal numbers. So you see that when X go to zero, it indeed goes to one. That's because the gluon mechanism takes over small X. But at this X, uh, this, uh, this directly show a mechanism which is like this. So what I did, I calculated a baryon uh, wave function by methods uh, similar to what I just described. Then I calculated wave function for five quarks, with four quarks and anti-quark, a pentaquark wave function. This is here. And then by first order perturbation theory, I calculated a tail, five, five particle tail of three particle nucleon and calculated finally this asymmetry. So this oscillating line, uh, uh, look at the blue one. It's oscillating because I had very limited, uh, I use the matrix method and I have very limited bases. So if you use larger bases, it will not be oscillating like this. But uh, this is a calculation of this asymmetry 
compared to experimental data. This is the same data as the previous plot. The previous plot was D bar over U bar. This is D bar minus U bar. So you see that uh, the effect does not disappear in small x. The absolute difference can keep rising. And this is this calculation. So uh, this is one more manifestation of instantons that there is a Toft vertex, which is flavor asymmetric, and that generate very large visible asymmetry in the C. So this is my last slide. Uh, what I told you, one thing is that we have, we can derive Hamiltonian and wave function. We uh, at the moment included simple uh, kind of linear Hamiltonian, which with some trick can be made quadratic and then solved. And basically it give you in first approximation a oscillator in transverse coordinate and the signal coordinate. And in second approximation it has some potential which can be included either, by, either numerically or with this uh, large matrix diagonalization method. So we know how to solve these Hamiltonians. And uh, this way function can produce form factor, PDFs, DAs, et cetera. We already did it for uh, heavy, for mesons, heavy and light, and for baryons, which are fluid asymmetric. Now about instantons. So instantons uh, were discovered 50 years ago. 40 years ago, there was this dilute instant liquid, which is very good for chiral symmetry breaking. Now there are also this uh, denser contribution, which uh, contribute, it doesn't contribute to small Dirac eigenvalues, but it can still can have fields and this field strength contribute to this double use with some lines. So it contribute to forces, the central forces and more important the spin forces. And in, uh, Heavy quarconia, we compared it and it works very reasonably. In heavy light and light light system, that needs to be uh, calculated and appended by the stock contribution. So it is interesting that uh, this instanton still uh, show new effects. Uh, we think that uh, potentials in, in mesons and baryons are mostly of this origin. And of course, we need much more detailed study of the spin forces in particular in mesons and baryons. And then there are this uh, Toft uh, Lagrangian and the Toft Lagrangian is related to, to instanton zero mode. So it is uh, operate on the level of old dilute instant liquid model. And that one uh, create, uh, Many of, of these effects. So this is uh, this is asymmetry is one effect which uh, directly uh, induced by Toft, and also the Toft Lagrangian uh, contribute to spin spin and uh, all the spin dependent uh, potential for light quarks, not for heavy one but for light. So in principle, to summarize, we try to put the whole uh, subject of uh, hadronic spectroscopy on the light front. Uh, the benefit is that we don't need non-relativistic approximation and we can treat similarly for cornea and light mesons. Uh, of course, there are some interactions like Toft, which depend on mass explicitly, but uh, that, that can be done. So that is it for today.